Hopkins here at Brighton. I um, give you a warm welcome to join us tonight. And tonight we have a special presentation which has been advertised around our community on the topic, Israel, a witness to God's existence. As you might know, today marks the 75th year anniversary of the State of Israel. And while we as Bible readers and Christadelphians know that this is a political event largely, we believe the Bible shows us that there's far more going on than just mere politics on the surface as far as the state of Israel goes. And we believe that the Bible can enlighten us on what exactly is going on. Uh, for a state, a nation state, that can fit 47 times into the state of South Australia, Israel is but a very small nation on the world stage. And yet, it continues to capture the world's attention in the headlines. And we believe, friends, the Bible explains why this is the case on a much more profound level than just politics. So we warmly invite you to listen with interest tonight as our visiting friend, Mr. Greg Horwood, presents uh, to us on this fantastic topic. So we're gonna um, ask you to rise tonight as we start with prayer, um, and we'll do that now. Let's pray. Dear God, our Father, we come in prayer tonight around your word, the Bible, in light of recent news of the existence of the nation of Israel. And Lord God, we come with Bibles open tonight to seek for your explanation as to your purpose with this tiny nation situated in the Middle East. And Father, we know that you have made promises to this nation and the people of this nation, and they play a critical role in the unfolding of the story of your word, the Bible, and your future purpose with this earth. We pray that you'll help us to understand this tonight and be excited by the power of prophecy in your Bible, which makes your Bible and your word stand apart from any other book. We come and seek your blessing tonight, and we give you honor as our creator. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, again, uh, a very warm welcome. Our topic tonight is Israel, a witness to God's existence, and that's gonna be presented by Mr. Greg Horwood. To introduce this theme, we're gonna read from part of a chapter of the Bible, the prophet Isaiah, and that's gonna be taken from Isaiah 43. We're gonna read the first 13 verses, and Dan Maluga will read that for us. Isaiah 43, verses one to 13. Thanks, Dan. Reading with you from the inspired word of God at Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 13. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Saviour. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, Thou hast been honourable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee, and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east, and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far, and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Even every one that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. 
Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say, it is truth. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no saviour. I have declared and I have saved, and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Well, thank you, Dan. With that uh, introduction from the prophet Isaiah, we'll ask Mr. Greg Horde to present on Israel, a witness to God's existence. Thank you, Tim, and good evening, everyone. So, as Tim mentioned, today's the 75th anniversary of the Declaration of the State of Israel. So, if you're good at your maths, 14th of May, 1948. So what? So what? There's plenty of nations bigger than Israel. Tim pointed out its geographical size was fit 47 times into the state of South Australia. But there's plenty of nations smaller as well. So it's not size that matters, is it? There's plenty of nations that are younger. And there's plenty of nations that are older. Why does it matter about the nation of Israel? Well, if, if you do what's normally done when you're wanting to find something out and you go online and search out what's special about Israel, you find lots of things that are special about Israel. There's a few little headline snaps. Hey, not surprisingly, many of these articles are put together by people who are overtly supporting Israel. But you can see some of the things there, some quite remarkable facts. You know, Israel ranks among the 10 most powerful countries in the annual list, the fourth strongest militarily. Well, that's not bad for a nation that uh, numbers, is it just over 9 million people? Australia's almost three times that, at 20, just under 27 million people. And that one in the middle there, the uh, Jewish contributions for 0.2% of the world population, having 23% of Nobel Prize winners. But you know, and not again, not surprisingly, there's plenty of things that point out the bad things about Israel as well. Israel, Palestine, the real reason there's still no peace. Ethnic cleansing, corrupt leaders, terror. What readers are saying about Israel and Palestine? A threshold crossed. There's a picture of a young Palestinian boy running alongside a wall. Apartheid and persecution. So, so if we sort of turn to mankind, shall we say, and say, well, well what's special about Israel and things? Sure, there's, there's a few peculiarities, a few distinguishing features that perhaps set this, this small nation apart. But the thing that becomes really clear is that Israel is very much a polarising country, isn't it? it? People either love it or hate it. And it's been that way for really all time. It's been that way with the Jews. There's, and there's something strange about this. Most most of the world's population don't actually feel that strongly about other countries. You, know, you think about the emotions associated with other countries who, incidentally, had independence around about the same time as Israel. So I had a bit of a look, came up with some countries. 
I didn't know them off the top of my head. Barbados. Anyone feel strongly about Barbados? Like it or hate it? Botswana. Cyprus. Ghana. Even Timor-Leste, which is probably closer to Australia and when some of us in the audience can remember it going through its, its period of time, even that has limited emotional appeal for people. Yeah, sure, if you live there, then you've got a, you've got a sense of, of belonging. If you're served there with the armed forces, then you'd probably feel even more strongly about it again. But for the bulk of people, they just don't have an opinion. But not so the Jews. Yeah, it doesn't matter what time we go through, they've been extremely strong feelings, particularly of antagonism in most cases, but particularly strong feelings for or against. And here's, here's a couple of examples. This, the first one there, terrible picture. I don't know if there's any German reading people here in the audience, but um, you can see here, this was during the period of the Nazis in, in Germany. Well, World War II and just slightly before. Here they've put together, for the edification, no doubt, of the watchers, a documentary about the Jews. Documentary. So the German position is pretty clear and we know, of course, the terrible events associated with the Holocaust, which we will touch on briefly later. But it's not just the Germans. We can start saying, oh, those you know, dreadful Germans during World War II. But That was the Serbians. And the caption there, you don't know yet, dot, 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 beware. And that shows, as you can probably see in the picture, this stereotypical Jewish evil creature with a rope and a noose on the rope sort of strangling all the poor citizens of Serbia who had to be aware of it. And, uh, OK, well, maybe it's just those countries, but it's not. It goes on. The French... There's a magazine, they had the Awakening of the People magazine. And again, the, uh, the caption there, the real enemies of France. And the picture shows the, you know, the handsome, sort of clean, living French young man who's, who's holding at bay this evil finance-focused Jew. You can see there on the, you know, the Star of David and, and pound signs and other you know, Masonic Lodge, all the, all the oof, things we need to be careful of, so the French people thought. And then, of course, this, this last one is from Czechoslovakia. So it actually makes up a, a mantelpiece decoration that shows three Jewish people like pigs. Caricature of pigs. It's dreadful. It's absolutely dreadful. And people would take that, I assume, and put it on their mantelpiece alongside the porcelain ducks and whatever else that they had there and, and look at it as they're having their breakfast in the morning and, and somehow think that's OK. But that's the past, isn't it? That's 70 years ago. The world's not like that now. Isn't it? October last year. This creature, who I had to get some assistance with the pronunciation, who I believe his name is Kanye, 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 something, Kanye West, apparently tweeted a thing that says, going DEFCON 3 on Jewish people. Well, now, I can't say I'm exactly up to scratch with what that means, but I gather what it means is effectively death to Jewish people. And this, this guy, apparently, is a well-known singer of some sort. And in October 2022, 8th of October 2022, all within our lifetimes, that's what he said. And you say, oh, he's just crazy. You know, he's out on his own. No, look, what are they doing? A Nazi salute on a bridge in America with a sign that says Kanye is right about the Jews. In other words, kill the Jews. That's, that's now. 
And there's plenty more. And you have to look through and, frankly, it makes staggering reading, staggering people that, that refuse to accept that the, that the Holocaust even occurred despite the you know, photographic evidence and, and the fact that there's still some people alive today who physically saw with their eyes the outcomes of the atrocities at that point in time. But what about the Christadelphians? What about the Christadelphians? What's our political alignment? And Tim touched a bit on this in his opening marks, it, remarks. What's our political allegiance with the state of Israel? Again, as Tim said, we're not a political body. As a community, we don't even engage in local politics, let alone international politics as well. So you'd say, well, oh, OK, that's fine, but why are you holding then a special lecture to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the establishment of the nation of Israel? Well, it's because, it's because we are Bible students. And it is impossible, it is impossible to read in any way, shape or form any of the Bible without coming to the absolutely inevitable conclusion that the Jews and the land of Israel feature prominently in God's interaction with mankind and his revealed purpose. You, you can't read the Bible without seeing the Jews and Israel as a, as a key cornerstone, a foundation point that features from the earliest parts of the Bible, literally Genesis, right through to Revelation. And so our purpose tonight is to try and piece all of that together. So we're not interested, again, reinforcing what Tim said, we're not interested in the political side. Let me rephrase that. We're interested in it, but we don't engage in the political side of it. That happens. We believe that God has that control. He is superintending events to occur in the way that he knows they need to be to bring about his purpose. But our interest is understanding what that purpose is and how the existence of Israel plays a part in that. And then ultimately, ultimately, what does it mean for us? So I want to have a look to begin with at our reading for this evening in Isaiah 43. And, and this is a staggering chapter. As Dan was reading it, I don't know if the power of it actually struck you. Here's the almighty God speaking. The almighty God, creator of all things author of the Bible. And this is what he says, verse 1. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob. Oh, who's he talking about? Who's O Jacob? Well, he that formed thee, O Israel. We're going to see in just a moment that Jacob and Israel are the same thing. Jacob's name changed to Israel and his descendants became the nation of Israel. So here's God and he's addressing Israel. What does he say to them? Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. That's staggering, isn't it? Absolutely staggering. But God goes on. He doesn't just leave it at that point in time. He doesn't just sort of put it out there that this, this nation of Israel insignificant and sure their significance has ch changed down throughout history which uh, again we might touch on some of those things this evening but but at the end of the day still relatively few in number it's not just the fact that they are his that they belong to him there's even something more staggering about it he says as, as you can sort of continue on then I've, I've put a bit of a summary there on the screen proceed some of the verses God's with them he's going to bring their seed from the East, gather thee from the west. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? That's interesting. So somehow, in this message that God's talking about for Israel, the regathering of Israel is an important part. Can you see that? It's not just saying that the first verse, in a sense, could apply to anybody. I've redeemed you. You're mine. But I'm with you, says God, and I'm going to do something that involves regathering from the east. Gathering from the west, I'll say to the north, give up. To the south, keep not back. 
Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Well, well that clearly, that clearly is saying, whatever else we know about Israel, and we've got a lot to learn yet this evening, that whatever God's involvement with them is, somehow the idea of them being scattered and then having to be returned again is part of that, isn't it? Shouldn't necessarily be surprised by that. It's written in. God makes it almost fundamental to the existence that he has with them. Why is that? Because, he goes on to say, even everyone that is called by my name. For I've created him for my glory. I've formed him. I've made him. So whatever God's trying to achieve, he's doing it through Israel. And then he goes on to say perhaps the most staggering thing of all. Look at verse 10 of Isaiah 43. Ye, Israel, are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. <laughs> so it's almost like God's on trial, isn't it? You can imagine a, a trial scene in a court somewhere. A and it's about, well, well, who's God? Who is the God? That's the bit that's going through the court. And you can imagine a court scene, you know, people bring up various witnesses. Where were you on the night of, etc.? And what does God do? Who does God bring forth as the witness? Israel. See that? You're my witnesses. You, Israel, are my witnesses. That I am he. And he goes on to reinforce that point. I, verse 11, even I am the Lord. Beside me there is no saviour. I've declared, I've saved, I've showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. So God's very existence and his power is tied up in this nation of Israel. Remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. So that section from Isaiah 43 shows us a few things, doesn't it? it? It points to the very fact that Israel is the proof of God's existence. Does God exist? Look at Israel, says God. That's the proof I use, says God, Israel, my witnesses. That's a pretty important point. Tied up in that is the fact that Israel would be regathered. So part of that witness, part of that proof, part of the evidence that God is going to bring for the very fact of his existence is associated with the fact that Israel would be gathered, regathered and brought back. And God would be their saviour. The end of verse 11. He is the saviour. Beside me there is no saviour. So those concepts are expanded on a little bit in Isaiah 45. So if you wish, you can turn over a couple of pages to Isaiah 45 and I've got it on the screen as well. Isaiah 45 expands on Isaiah 43 and it links the saving of the Jews with God's purpose with the whole earth. So it's, it's in a sense, it's one thing for God to have an interest in Israel. It's one thing for God to look at Israel and say, hey, I'm working with you, Israel, and I'm gathering you in. But look what Isaiah 45 does. Verse 17. Verily, oops, sorry, I'll find the right verse. But Israel shall be saved in, Yahweh, in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. So there's our theme of saving that we looked at before. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded, world without end. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. And can you, can you see what those verses are actually showing us? So God extrapolates his work with Israel to cover the whole earth. So he does that. So just like I'm working with Israel, he says, so his purpose with the whole earth comes to pass. And you can see that, that extrapolation from Israel to a larger 
whole of earth perspective in that. And these are interesting things, aren't they? They suddenly open up a whole lot more interest and detail and, and a need for us to actually sort of uncover and, and decipher this message that's related to Israel for our own sake of understanding what hope there is so far as God's saving of the whole earth is concerned, forming it to be inhabited, creating it not in vain. Now, if you're sitting there with a slightly sceptical mind, you might be thinking to yourself, it's all very well, but this is the Old Testament, and we all know that the Old Testament is thousands of years before, and you know, we've moved on since then. Jesus came. These things don't apply, we might think, but we would be wrong. We'd be wrong. In actual fact... The New Testament just takes the flow of God's purpose as seen in the nation of Israel in the Old Testament and expands it to include the whole world just as Isaiah 45 verse 18 implied. It's quite remarkable how it does it. And so you can see here, there's two particular quotes. First one is the words of the Apostle Paul. And he writes in Romans chapter 9, and of course the Apostle Paul was, by birth, a Jew. And he says, and we're sort of breaking a bit into the context there, but he talks about my brethren, the Jews, my kinsmen according to the flesh. So he's, he's talking about the people that, you know, his, his blood countrymen, if you like, which were physically Jews. He says, well, they're Israelites. What about them is the context of the question. They're Israelites. To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever? Now, we, you might look at that and say, well, I actually don't even know what half those things are. And that's okay. We'll get through some of them tonight. Others of them we won't get through. There's an opportunity afterwards to, to investigate them. But even if you don't understand each of them, can you not see the point that Paul's saying? Are the Jews gone? Are they finished? Is God no longer interested in them? No, look at all the things that God has built up in those people. Adoption as his children. The glory, which is the purpose that he has with them. The covenants we're going to touch on at least one of those covenants in a moment. Promises that God has made. Promises. The Almighty God has made promises. The law which they received. Opportunity to serve God. And of course, as he says, you know, well, is there anything special about the Jews? Well, let's not forget Jesus Christ, according to the flesh, was a Jew who is, of course, God blessed forever. So, so far as the Apostle Paul's concerned, is, is God finished with the Jews? By no means. There's an opportunity that came with their rejection of Jesus Christ for non-Jews to have a part in that great hope that God has with the world, but they still feature in this special place in terms of God's unravelling, his rolling out of his purpose with the earth. Now, that's the Apostle Paul. We might say, well, perhaps he was uh, biased. Well, out of the quote on the screen from John 4, verse 22, are the words of none other than Jesus Christ himself. None other than Jesus Christ. The one who was crucified by the Jews. Betrayed, crucified, humiliated, mocked and he said speaking to a woman from Samaria when they're at a well and he's, he's elevated the conversation around to a future hope and things, he turned to her and he said salvation is of the Jews. Not salvation was of the Jews or once upon a time salvation was of the Jews. No salvation is salvation is of the Jews. Somehow, somehow, whatever's involved in that Jewish nation, 
is the foundation point for salvation to other people, including non-Jews, such as that Samaritan woman that Jesus was speaking to in John chapter 4. Now, if it wasn't already obvious by this point in time, if, you, if you're sort of putting two and two together, you'd be thinking, now, hang on a second, we're here remembering the 75th anniversary of the state of Israel, and yet we've spent the whole time talking about events that occurred thousands of years ago. So clearly, Israel has existed a long time, a long time more, if I've got my English right, than 75 years ago. And of course, you're absolutely correct. The nation of Israel came into existence around about BC 1600-ish. And the way it came about, we'll spend a few moments looking at. You may well have heard of this man, Abraham. Abraham, the father of Israel. In fact, let's, let's turn up Genesis chapter 12. Remember Paul's point in Romans chapter 9 to the Jews belong the promises, the covenant that God has said. Well, here is one of the key covenants, promises that God made to Abraham. And this is around about BC 2100 to 2000s-ish. So 2000 years before Jesus Christ came on the earth. And verse 1 of Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, who's Abram? Well, Abram and Abraham are the same people. So Abram was born Abram, and then his name was changed to Abraham later on. So we will use it interchangeably for the purpose of tonight. Same person. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Well, it's a strange kind of promise, isn't it? It's a strange kind of promise. It's strange for a number of reasons. See, when this promise was given, Abraham lived in a place called Ur. And God appears to him, as revealed here, through an angel, no doubt, and gives him this promise. But if you were reading it carefully, you'd notice that God doesn't actually say what land Abram would get, does he? He just says, a land that I will show thee. It's a bit like you know, someone saying, Tim, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a great opportunity to get a property. Leave here and you'll get a property. What's the first question Tim's going to say? Where? I want to know about this property. But God doesn't tell him, does he? he? And in fact, we know from Hebrews chapter 11 that this becomes the hallmark, the hallmark, the, the foundation stone of Abraham's greatness, his faith. He gets a message from God and he believes in God so much that he acts on that message, even though every single sort of, if we're like, normal self-focused human being would want to know the details. Abraham says, well, if that's the message that comes from God, I'm going to do it. And he did. He got up. And he left with his family, left with his nephew and his brother, his father, the wives. And they followed the Euphrates up and they actually came to Haran. You can read all this in the previous chapter. It goes through some of those details. And God appeared again to him in Haran and said... You're not yet at the land, keep going. And so he ends up coming down. And when he gets down to Canaan, what we know now is the nation or the land of Israel, verse 7. And what I just sort of summarised, you can get from the previous verses. Verse 6, Abraham passed through the land. And verse 7, the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. See, now it's a bit more specific, isn't it? So he's moved from a land that God was going to show him to this land. You've got to the location that I want you to get to, Abraham, says God. 
So that's one interesting thing. He went without knowing which land he would get until he actually got to that location and God said, this is it, this is the land. But look at the other elements of the promise as well. He's told, I'll make of you a great nation. You personally, Abraham. So you would turn into a great nation. Now, interestingly enough, at this point in time, Abraham, or Abram, and his wife, Sarai, whose later name was later changed to Sarah, couldn't have children. Sarah was barren, unable to bear children. And God says, and this is part of this test of faith that, that Abraham passed with, as it were, such flying colours, God says, I'm going to turn you into a great nation. He hasn't got any children or everyone else is having children left, right and centre. Abraham and Sarah aren't. But Abraham believes God. And if God says he'll have children, the fact that he hasn't yet and can't physically yet is no issue for him. And the third key thing about this particular blessing given to Abraham, and this is, this is the... This is the thread that we've already been touching on through Isaiah 45, through Romans chapter 9, this like hint of a greater and a linked blessing that comes is this last bit, this last bit. In you, Abraham, shall not just that your descendants, not just those individual descendants that would literally come through your genealogy, but in thee shall all, all families of the earth be blessed. And you sort of see how that promise is just so expansive. It's so expansive. It, it becomes all-encompassing. God speaking to an individual, promising that from that individual would come a nation. And somehow, through that individual all the families of the earth, all the nations of the earth would end up receiving a blessing. Well, no prizes for guessing which nation came from Abraham. We can see the, the family tree up here. Eventually, again, we mentioned the fact that Abraham and Sarah were, were barren or couldn't have children. Sarah was, at least. Abraham had three wives, ultimately, he had Ishmael about 13 years before Sarah had a, her son, Isaac. And he had a number of other sons by another wife, Keturah. But God's promise, as was given in Genesis chapter 3, was through this line, through Sarah. And when Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 years old, Miraculously, miraculously, and that's a key word. We're going to see that word or hear that word come up a few times tonight. Miraculously, Isaac was born. And then Isaac married Rebekah and they had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Ah, oh, where have we come across Jacob before? Remember that? Isaiah 43, wasn't it? God's the, this God of Jacob. Ah, oh, I've heard that name. And then from Jacob, who effectively had four wives, we ended up with the, his sons, Dan, Naphtali, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, that was a daughter, Dinah, Gad, Asher, Joseph and Benjamin. And Joseph had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. So, family tree. We all know family trees. We could probably draw up our own family tree. What's so impressive about this? How are we moving towards this Israel piece? Well, as you probably saw in the little uh, brackets underneath here, Jacob's name was changed by God from Jacob to Israel. Israel means a prince with ale, prince with power, prince with God. So, so Jacob's name means supplanter. So sort of someone that's you know, grasping after something, chasing after something, and God says, well, I'm going to change your name from Jacob to Israel. So when we talk about the nation of Israel or, or the Israelites or whatever, the, the namesake, the beginning point, was actually someone whose name started off as Jacob, but his name was changed to Israel. And therefore, Dan, Naphtali, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, etc., etc., are the children of Israel. And the children 
of Israel ended up becoming the heads of tribes of Israel. So there was a tribe or a clan or a family of Judah and Reuben and Dan and Naphtali, etc. So we have the 12 tribes of Israel, which were named after the 12 sons of Israel. Now, slight peculiarity, Levi was, was used specifically for priestly duties, so they weren't sort of treated in that a tribe in terms of a possession. And Joseph had a double portion because of the great work he did in bringing his, his brothers to, back to God. And so two of his sons ended up becoming the tribes. So the 12 tribes, it's actually 13, the 12 tribes that possessed the land were all of them, including Joseph's sons, minus Levi, who were the priests or, or helped the priests and were the priestly family and spread across all of the diff other tribes teaching God's way. So Israel was the name of Jacob. The children of Israel were Jacob's children. They became the tribes of Israel and eventually they became the nation of Israel. So Jacob, or Israel, and his extended family, the Bible actually specifies how many, 70 people, they went down into Egypt and they came out under Moses, and most people will have heard of Moses and this, this deliverance from Egypt, the plagues that were in Egypt. They came out 430 years later, as, as the Bible states it. And at that point, they had grown into a large group of people and they were established, they were established by God as a nation. So they went in as a family into Egypt and they came out and were established as a nation. God gave them a law. God gave them, you know, like any nation has, Australia has it. Ours is probably all based on the old mother country of England, but, you know, constitution and laws and processes, we have it. You can only do... 60 kilometres an hour out there or 50 or something. All those laws that you, you can and can't do. Well, God did the same for, for Israel. So when they came out of Egypt, they were constituted a nation. They had a constitution. They had a law they had to keep. In fact, the law that's revealed in the Bible, in many respects, is the basis for so many of the laws we have in our own modern day countries as well. Mark point. You probably didn't see it, <laughs> but, you know, that very second slide, I think it was, which talked about all the amazing things about Israel, one of them, sort of hidden away, was that from Israel came the basis for government of most countries. Now, it's true. It's true. You can look at the law that was given, the constitution that was given, how people were to be treated. It was so much ahead of its time, and so many of those principles sort of excluding the religious ones, but so many of the, the general principles of, of good governance that are contained in that law carry through to the countries of the world which generally have good governance. So is that sort of clear to see it? Abraham's promise that from him would come a nation. He has a son, Isaac, who has a son called Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel. He has 12 sons the 12 sons of Israel, children of Israel, they become the head of tribes. So now you've got the children of Israel, the tribes of Israel, who ultimately become the nation of Israel. And all of that sort of came into place around about 1600 um, BC. And, and God made it clear that his relationship to them as a nation <coughs> was a special one. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a quote there from Exodus 19. So this is, this is fairly early on in that, that constitution as a nation time frame. If you obey, obey my voice, keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure unto me above all people. You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But not all went well. There's lots of things we could look at, but <clears throat> Psalm 106 captures it sufficiently. 
They didn't do what God said. They're taken into a land, are told to destroy the nations that were there, who, who were engaged in practices and processes and, and activities that were so abhorrent to God's way, burning their children in the fire, for example. But they didn't do what they were told to do. They mingled amongst them, they learned their works, they served their idols, which became a snare unto them, as God had said it would do. And so, throughout the whole history of Israel, there's been repeated history of disobedience and prophesied consequence. Now, that sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Because remember back to Isaiah 43. One of the key things that God spoke about in Isaiah 43 was him regathering, regathering them back from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south. I'll regather you. So God is continually reinforcing the fact that he works with them. He works with them, bringing them back. But they're only scattered because God knew that they'd be scattered. And if you come, we won't, from a timing point of view, turn this up. I've just got the examples up on the screen here so you're welcome to turn up Deuteronomy 28 if you want it's a very very long chapter but in Deuteronomy 28 there's this prophecy that God gives about the fact that they would disobey him and that there would be consequences which included them being scattered being taken away from this privileged position that they had with him so you can see here Here's, here's the sort of, if you like, the conditional statement, isn't it? If thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And, and Deuteronomy 28 describes all these terrible things. You know, the, the botch of Egypt, for example, and other bits and pieces, which, which God's saying, that's what's going to happen. You're going to be my peculiar people while ever you do what I say. But if you're going to do what everyone else around you is doing, then you'll reap what everyone else around you reaps. There's a consequence associated with their failure to follow God's ways. And, and then God specifically, right back in Deuteronomy, so this is, this is the fifth book of the Bible, right back in Deuteronomy, God lists off prophecies relating to what would happen to them. And the first one of those is in verse 36. The Lord will bring thee and the, the king which thou have set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. And, and we know that happened. There's a whole pile of prophecies that came later on which provided more and more specific detail God sent more and more prophets warning them warning them to turn and change but ultimately in BC 600 the Babylonians took Israel away into captivity but God had prophesied they'd come back Isaiah prophesied that didn't they God would gather them and bring them and Deuteronomy 28 goes on to talk about a second major catastrophe, apparently, but actually part of God's prophesied uh, future for the nation of Israel. The Lord would bring against them a nation from far, from the end of the earth, swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favour to the young. And again, that happened. There's two distinct prophecies of, of captivity and conquest right back in Deuteronomy 28. In AD 70, the Romans came down and that, that little uh, relief there, is, I'm sure many of you will have seen that on the Arch of Titus, that triumphal arch that you can still see today, showing the... The menorah there being taken off as the Romans were successful in AD 17, sacking the city of Jerusalem. It's people that came from the end of the earth, swift as the eagle flies. There's so much power in that symbology, isn't it? That eagle representative of the, of the Roman legions. The tongue they didn't understand. Fierce countenance. And one can read contemporary historical accounts of those events that happened there and see to some extent just how terrible and how terrible the events were, but how accurate these words were. Not regard the person of the old, nor show favour to the young. And, and the descriptions of the destruction of Jerusalem that happened with the streets literally running in blood. 
God had prophesied that before. He knows the end from the beginning. Yeah, the regathering of Israel was also prophesied in Ezekiel 37. And I've just got the key verses up there. And again, many of you will be familiar with it. The words of Ezekiel 37 have been turned into sort of song, popular song. Uh, and, and a lot of people understand the concept. It's such a clear prophecy. Such a clear prophecy. Ezekiel goes out and he sees this valley and it's full of dry bones. Dry bones. There's no moisture in them. There's no life in them. Dry and hopeless. He prophesies. God tells him to prophesy against them. The bones come together, bone to bone, all lining up in this great mixed up pile of bones and they start to form these skeletons and then as he looks he sees the ligaments coming upon them and then the skin coming upon them and all of a sudden, I mean, it would be a pretty, pretty sort of freaky view, wouldn't it, if you were seeing this vision and seeing uh, stuff of sci-fi type things. And all of a sudden now you've got these bodies, lifeless bodies lying there. It's an army, it's an army of people. And then... Ezekiel is told to breathe, to prophesy again, and the, and the Spirit of God comes and goes into these lifeless bodies that have been built up from these dry bones with no hope. And it's a prophecy of what God's going to do with Israel. I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side. That's what Isaiah 43 said, wasn't it? And bring them into... Oh, their own land. Poof. What are we remembering again? 75 years since Israel was redeclared a nation in the land of Palestine, as it was known then, which happened to be, if you remember that map, the exact same spot that God said when Abraham came down from Haran, from Ur up to Haran, and then he came down and he got to that spot and God said, unto thy seed will I give this land, this land that you're standing on now. Amazing, isn't it? Bring them into their own land, not someone else's land, not, not somewhere in Africa or, or middle of Australia or somewhere. Their own land. I will make them one nation. In the land, upon the mountains of Israel. On the mountains of Israel. One king shall be king to them all. They shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. And what a, this powerful prophecy of Ezekiel 37. Powerful in so many ways, but, but not least of which is the fact that it's easy to understand. It interprets itself. God gives the explanation of the vision in Ezekiel 37. There's another key prophecy that I want you to turn up now, and that's Luke 21. Luke 21 has a prophecy about the scattering, a specific, incredibly specific prophecy about the scattering and the re-establishment of Israel that we have seen in our own lifetime. And it, generally speaking, this prophecy is called the Olivet Prophecy. Why is it called the Olivet Prophecy? Because Jesus literally came out to the Mount of Olives, which is sort of near the temple, and gave this prophecy. Now, for the sake of time, I'm just going to sort of summarise it. But what ended up happening was this. In verse 5... The disciples are admiring the temple. So, they, so they're looking and they can see this glory of Herod's temple, as it was it, an impressive building. You, there's a whole lot of work going on to uh, excavate it from an archaeological perspective. Now, and they're, they're admiring it. You see that. They, you know, as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. So there they are. Oh, wow, you see that? Yeah, oh, that looks great. Jesus throws a bomb in the middle of it, doesn't he? He says, verse 6, as for these things which ye behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So there they are admiring these stones. And Jesus said, well, actually, they're all going to be destroyed. So what would you do if you were a disciple listening to that? You'd want to know when, wouldn't you? And that's what they do. Verse 7. They asked him, saying, Master... 
But when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? So, an obvious question. He's just given them a, a bombshell and they want to know when it will occur. And see, so Jesus goes on, and we're not going to read it now, but he goes on to describe the events that would lead up to and include AD 70, where, as we've already mentioned before, and as, as, as prophesied back in Deuteronomy 28, Jerusalem would be destroyed by the Roman armies. The temple would be destroyed. And you, you can see some of those things as you go through. You know, there you hear verse 9, wars and commotions. These things are going to happen. Nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. You've got all this political turmoil and, and because that's exactly what ended up happening. Zealots came and they started rebelling against the Roman rule that was there, setting up little bands, some of which were successful. Guerrillas attacking the Romans, Romans responding in force. All these things happen and Jesus outlined what they would and eventually it gets up to the point where the temple itself becomes sacked, destroyed. Verse 20, when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, know the des desolation thereof is nigh. Get out, he says in verse 21. Verse 22, these are the days of vengeance. Woe unto them with, that are with child, to them that are giving... I mean, you, you just got to hope in verse 23. You've got to hope you haven't got little kids. That's how bad this is. I'll fall by the edge of the sword. I'll be led away captive into all nations. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. Amazing, amazing prophecy exactly what happened he was prophesying this in 80 30 odd 40 years later 40 years later it came to pass jews taken out the romans had had enough driven mad by this rebellious group of people determined determined to get rid of the problem once and for all so much so that as we saw before there's they, they built at the end of it this triumphal arch the Arch of Titus, commemorating the destruction of this rebellious people. But did you notice how he sort of stopped partway through verse 24 there? And it says there that Jerusalem would be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, if you were standing in AD 70... And you saw the destruction. You saw the streets running with blood. You saw the Romans demolishing everything in both their fierce anger and, and hatred for the Jews at that point in time, as well as, as well as for their determination that it could never be used again as a, as a seat of rebellion. And you knew that the Jews were going to be taken out into all the different countries. And the Rome, Roman Empire pretty much had everywhere of the, the known world at that point in time. And someone said to you, but good news, but good news, the Jews will be coming back there. You'd say, no chance. No chance. They're done. They're gone. But God says, Jesus says, through God's word, they are coming back. There's going to be a time when the times of the Gentiles would be fulfilled. There's going to be a miraculous restoration of Israel. They're going to be in control again of Jerusalem. When the times of the Gentiles is fulfilled, by definition, that means the Jews are back in control. And then Jesus goes on in, in verse 25 and 26 to describe the global conditions from that period of time. And, and the beauty we have is we've got the benefit of hindsight. We can see the prophetic declarations actually coming to pass. And we know what happened. We know what happened. Against all odds, against all odds, 1,900 years after these events, and 1,900 years, what people could retain their identity for a couple of hundred years in dispersion, let alone 1,900 years? But 1,900 years. 100 years, from a human point of view, impossible. 1,900 years goes past and then God intervenes. And in what a way he intervenes because we have this miracle of the restoration of Israel. 
God gets to work. God makes these events come to pass. The prophecies are going to happen because God said that they would happen because right from Isaiah 43, right from Deuteronomy 28, right from Exodus, God had made clear that he was using Israel as a, as a foundation stone for his work that would involve all of the world. And amazing things happened. 1896, a journalist, Theodore Herzl's, he saw a miscarriage of justice, a, an officer of, in the French army, Dreyfus, was falsely accused. He was, he was made a scapegoat, accused of treachery, publicly humiliated. And, and Herzl looked at this and he could see, and, and pretty much everyone knew it, it was nothing short of absolute anti-Semitism. Blaming a Jew because he's a Jew. And one year later, one year later, this man, inspired by the need for them to have their own homeland, set up the first Zionist Congress. And again, we are out of time, so I'm going to have to go through this with fair speed. But from there, the wheels kept moving. Isn't it? And you can see how, it's, the way I look at it is, it's like God, God made sure that, and, and it fits with his divine timeline anyway, but it's almost like God made sure that the time was so long, it was so long that it was physically impossible from a human point of view to bring about his purpose. Yeah, if, if the Romans came in AD 70 and destroyed the Jews and took them away and stuff, but they were regathered as a nation after, say, 15 years or 20 years, you'd say, oh, yeah, that's probably fair enough. We can imagine that, can't we? We can imagine that. Bad, yep, bad battles and things like that. But there's enough of them around to rebuild the country. There's enough people that still know their identity. They can set it up. But not for 2,000 years. Not for the, the hope of, a, of regathering themselves in the land, the hope of going back to Jerusalem. That's long gone. That's long gone after 100 years, let alone 2,000. But here now, it's the work of God, isn't it? And God's moving everywhere. He's moving with key people like Theodore Herzl. He's moving with governments. Governments. This is a classic. This chap, Allenby, 1917, December 1917, rides into Jerusalem. Well, actually, he didn't ride in. He walked in, rode up to Jerusalem. The British taking over the control from the Turkish power. And there's a whole piece we haven't got time to look at, which is just staggering around, you know, why did, why did, when it should have been successful, why was Gallipoli unsuccessful? Militarily, it's, it was a good idea, it was a great idea, come and strike them in the underbelly, destroy Turkey while she was still weak. Brilliant idea. It failed. And instead... Britain had to come up through the Middle East, up through the, the Turkish areas of, of what we know now as Israel. And they were remarkably successful. Why? Because God's angels are at work. They're bringing to pass this incredible fulfilment here. And, and here there's a little uh, sort of reproduction of, of the letter, what's known as the Balfour Declaration. With this chap, Lord Balfour, helped to uh, put together that statement. His Majesty's government, British government, view with favour the establishment of a homeland for the Jews, or something like that, the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. We use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of a said object. Brilliant, isn't it? That's the way you'd write letters back in those days. None of this uh, Twitter or whatever. Amazing stuff. God's at, at work. And so people started coming back. And then, of course, we know that things took a dark turn. And the Bible talks in Jeremiah about there being fishes, you know, fishing, you're sort of putting out the bait, and people, you know, fish respond. And then it talks about hunters. I'll send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them. You're not fishing anymore. You're hunting. And we know the terrible atrocities associated with that. They became hunted and desperate, desperate for a homeland. You know, the, the, to some extent, I, I use the word apathy, but to some, it's totally understandable, isn't it? You know, you're giving away everything. Do you want to go to Israel? It sounds great. Yeah, but you, you give up your house and your job and your career and your investments and you've got to give up everything. Oh, no, I think I'll stay here. But not when you're being attacked. 
Not when your family's been taken off to the gas chambers and you've lost all your relatives. And so they came back in ships like this one. Probably heard of a ship called the Exodus, that one there. Overcrowded. Desperate to get back. And of course it was, it was the, the work of this evil conglomeration of, of the worst of mankind that paved the way through God's superintending of events to have a miracle. We've already seen how much the world's polarised by this, this people, the Jews. And yet what a miracle. In, in 1947, the United Nations voted, they voted in favour with all the antipathy towards the Jews, that they have their own state. Amazing. And there's the picture of David Ben-Gurion, who was the first Prime Minister announcing the state of Israel. And, and sure, it was challenging. There was a challenging sort of shape. And immediately, literally, as, as the British left that mandate, they're... they're marching feet left and went onto their ships. So the guns started firing as they were attacked. This new state, brand new state, no infrastructure in place, or no official infrastructure in place, no standing army in place officially. None of that. All the, all the, the establishments of a, of a nation that is so critical had to fight a battle on every front by countries that were established. Incredible. I, I, yeah. You know, again, without casting aspersions at uh, Timor Blessed or East Timor, you look at how much support they had to have, and, and justifiably so, when they had their independence in that time. Australia sent troops over there. United Nations sent troops over there to do it because they couldn't survive by themselves. Well, Israel had no one coming to their aid. Not one country. Not one country. And it wasn't just, you know, a militant Indonesia that was, that was gazing over them. They were attacked on every side by their neighbours. From a human point of view, they were doomed. But they weren't because God was in control. And then we get to this incredible thing where, to pick up the phrase, the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, and talking about times being fulfilled, I see my time is definitely fulfilled as well. So I'll go through this fairly swiftly and we'll bring it to an end. So Jerusalem was trodden down of the Gentiles until this remarkable six-day war that happened in 1967. And there's some pictures there of, of soldiers, and you may recognise... That, the, the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall, as it's sometimes known, the, the, a foundation part of that Herod's Temple that Jesus prophesied in Luke 21 would not be left standing. And he was absolutely right. That's just the, that's the retaining wall. It's not the temple, it's the retaining wall. Remarkable. So the conclusion you can only come to is that the words of Luke 21, verse 25 to 26, apply to people that have seen those events occur that have seen this. It's people like us, people that are, are living post the period of 1967 when Jerusalem's back in the hands of the Jews. And what's exciting about that? Well, it talks about things that would be happening. Verse 25, there'd be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Well, what's that talking about? Is that astrology? No, no, no. goes on to explain it, doesn't it? Upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, the powers of heaven shall be shaken. You know, this is what it's talking about. It's talking about leadership in turmoil. People don't know what to do. Distress, that word perplexity there means no way out. You don't have a solution. Is that what we're seeing now? Who's, who's got the solution for the environmental challenges we see around us? Or, or the finance challenges? Or the, the food problems that are around? Or terrorism? There's a good one. What about terrorism? Has anyone got a solution to that? There's no way out. The sea in the way, speaking about you know, the, the common people, us, roaring, roaring. 
men's hearts failing them for fear. And what would happen then? This is the key point. This is the key point. Verse 27. And then, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. After 1967, at a time of turmoil and no way out, suddenly the Lord Jesus Christ will return back to the earth to redeem those who are looking for their kingdom. And again, we are out of time, but it talks about this parable of the fig tree, which represents Israel springing forth. And it says at that time, other nations will as well. And, and this little plot shows the growth of nations. This is a growth of nations. It looks at the non-democracies. And, and you can see just springing forth from, from that sort of period of the Second World War onwards. Exponential growth. Exactly like our Lord prophesied. Remarkable. So what does it mean for us? What does it mean for us? Last two slides. We can't be ignorant, can we? Jesus Christ will return and save Israel. And in this process of saving them, there is hope and salvation for us. I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery or secret, as it means. It's like a, a special secret. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits. Blindness in part has happened to Israel. Sure, they've, they've gone their own way. They've gone away from God. But during that time, the non-Jews, the Gentiles, the fullness of them would come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. Because there's going to come from Zion a deliverer, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And God would establish his covenant with Israel forever and take away their sins. So, ladies and gentlemen, salvation is of the Jews. Jesus said it. Paul said it. It's up to us to understand what it means, to understand what the gospel means, to see the link between the gospel and God's promises made to Abraham so that we might be those who are adopted in to become part of that spiritual nation of Israel. Well, thank you, Greg. Um, you know, if you're wondering what are the reasons why the Christadelphians take the Bible seriously? It's nights like tonight um, that give us reason to do so. The veracity of what God has spoken in the past and the confidence that we have that those things will come to pass. And Israel, what God's spoken about Israel as we've seen tonight is one of those many proofs in scripture that show us that the Bible is something that we can absolutely trust um, as the direct word of God to us today. So that's an exciting thing, and we've been able to see the miracle that we're still witnessing uh, today in our day, thousands of years after those words were spoken about Israel. So we thank you, uh, Greg, for tonight. Um, the Bible is full of prophecies, and if you have any questions tonight about other things that the Bible um, speaks about or more questions about Israel, um, Greg is happy to field those questions or any other Christophans here tonight um, over a cup of tea and a biscuit. Um, in two weeks' time is our next public lecture here in this place, so in one week's time there won't be a, a public lecture, uh, but in two weeks' time there will be on May 28th, and that again is a night on prophecy, so if you are interested in prophecy from tonight, um, come along in two weeks' time at six o'clock. The subject then is Bible prophecies that affect your future, and the presenter then is Shem McAllister. So we thank you for coming along tonight. And we will ask you uh, to rise and we'll say um, a closing prayer by David Beale. Thank you. <clears throat> Almighty God, O thou who art 
from everlasting to everlasting, whose word shall never fail. We are thankful that thy word has been shown to us tonight to have been true and faithful to the nation of Israel. And we appreciate, O gracious Heavenly Father, that thy will shall be done on earth as it is done in heaven. We're thankful, gracious Father, for the wonderful witness of the return of the nation of Israel and the establishment of them as a significant nation in the earth. And we know, O Lord, that the remaining prophecies concerning them shall also be fulfilled. And we pray that thou help us to realise that these are signs to us and that we might be prepared for the coming of thy Son. And we pray that thou would help us to set our own lives in order and that we may give glory to you. We thank thee then, O gracious Father, for this wonderful privilege of the open scriptures tonight. And we pray, O loving God, that accept our thanksgiving for the refreshments that you provide in the drink and in the food which shall be provided. We are truly blessed by thee in the land of plenty. And we thank you, Father, for these thy mercies. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.